Hi AP Psych class, this is video number three for unit three. We've moved out of unit 3A on the nervous system and into the rather large and intricate 3B on the brain. And so we will be spending quite some time here. But if we take a look, we're going to first start uh, this unit, uh, subunit that is, on talking about ways to study the brain. In the packet that I gave you in class, there was a nice chart that summarized this information uh, for you concerning uh, the various neuroimaging techniques that are out there. So just a brief explanation for all of you here. Uh, the first here is that uh, unfortunately for the people that have suffered these, but fortunately for science and psychology, one of the best ways to study the brain is lesions. And um, a lesion is just a generic term we're going to use to describe any area of the brain that has suffered uh, any sort of tissue destruction. It could be um, naturally caused or um, experimentally caused. Um, don't don't freak out by that thought in that um, there may be some lesions that have been purposely caused uh, yet still remain uh, ethical uh, ways to look at the brain. Um, when we talk about hemispheric lateralization and the specialization of right versus left brain, we'll actually talk about uh, people who have um, had lesions purposely put placed on their corpus callosum in an attempt to alleviate um, severe seizures. And so I don't want you to think that experimentally caused uh, necessarily correlates with uh, unethical experimentation on the part of psychologists. Okay, so injuries or lesions can be a way to study the brain. Obviously the section that's not working um, can tell us a lot about what that section was in charge of doing. Um, an EEG, which just stands for electroencephalogram, is an amplified recording of waves of electrical activity that sweep across the brain. Um, we measure them by placing electrodes on the scalp and of the printout. Uh, kind of reminds me of seismic uh, activity um, that a geologist would study. Uh, those printouts of those waves can tell us if there are any changes in activity. Um, and they can, but they can't tell us where the activity occurred. And so EEGs would be our most simplistic form of studying the brain. Uh, they can tell us whether or not there is activity, but again, cannot tell us where that activity is occurring. Our neuroimaging techniques just keep getting better with technology. Um, a CT scan or a CAT scan, it, CT would just stand for a computerized tomography. Um, the simplistic way, the non-medical, non-science way to describe that is, uh, is like an x-ray of soft tissue. Um, and w if we x-ray the soft tissue, we can see um, any damaged areas uh, in the brain. A PET scan, um, that stands for positron emission tomography, is going to depict brain activity by showing us uh, the areas of the brain that are consuming glucose. Um, so the patient is injected with radioactive glucose um, and when the brain or areas of the brain are active, obviously those uh, neurons will be uh, consuming uh, glucose as it's converted into energy for the cells. And so that can tell us a lot about where changes in activity happens. But it can't really tell us much about the brain's physical structure. And so you can see uh, CAT scans will show us the physical structure, damaged and undamaged, but not a lot about the activity. And now PET scans will tell us lots about activity and changes in that activity, but not a lot about the brain structure. So pros and cons to all of these types of uh, techniques. An MRI, uh, which is magnetic resonance imaging, um, is just a detailed picture of the brain. And so any of you that have had an MRI done, whether it be of your head or of uh, any other body part, right, you know that you are put into this tube, which is actually a um, magnetic field that um, uh, s spins and basically is going to align um, the spinning atoms in your brain molecules uh, and then when the uh, like a radio pulse is, is inserted is going to like disorient or scatter all of these uh, molecules uh, and then as these molecules move back to uh, where they need to go that's so scientific um, they release a signal uh, and that signal can can give us a picture a more detailed picture uh, of the brain's uh, soft tissue 
Um, an fMRI, a functional, uh, is what the F stands for in front of MRI, is going to show brain structure and function. And so blood goes where the brain is active. And so they'll just t compare uh, MRIs taken within seconds of each other. And so it's kind of like looking at a flip book or a motion picture. We'll, we'll just uh, repeatedly um, generate images from an MRI so that we can see uh, not only changes in activity, but the structure in, um, of the brain. And so an fMRI, are, they're used quite often because they kind of combine the benefits of PET scans and regular MRIs. Um, people, I guess, love looking at fMRIs so they can, it's like cool because we can see what people are thinking. Uh, but something to keep in mind, um, you know, sure they show us where the brain activity occurs as people are thinking of specific things, um, but there's no guarantee that the activity is actually causing uh, associated thoughts or feelings, and so um, it's cool that how much we've learned through neuroimaging techniques, but the danger would just be relying on this very simple, like, if this part is active, therefore the person must be feeling this or thinking this, I, I think is a bit oversimplified. So just kind of keep that in mind as we look at these different um, techniques for studying the brain. Okay. As for the brain itself, it wouldn't all fit in a 15 minute video. And so we are only going to look at the hind brain and midbrain today. Um, we're kind of working again, as mentioned in class, from evolutionary oldest to evolutionary newest and most advanced parts of the brain. Okay. Um, perhaps you've heard the myth that we only use 10% of our brain power. And again, that is a myth. Right, uh, that sometimes these neuroimaging techniques mean that just because one section is illuminated or another section is illuminated, that people think the rest of the brain's not being used. Not true. We use our brain and all of our brain most of the time. Just because a section's not active at the time doesn't mean that things aren't happening. So keep that in mind. Okay, so the hindbrain. Uh, the hindbrain could, uh, we can talk about two areas of the hindbrain, the brainstem and the cerebellum. The brainstem is made up of a few important parts. Um, first know that the medulla is the base of the brainstem. So where the spinal cord enters the head, the base of the brainstem, the medulla is in charge of controlling um, primitive uh, automatic functions like heart rate and breathing. The pons is above the medulla um, and it helps coordinate very simple uh, reflexive movements. And the uh, reticular formation is just a nerve network in the brainstem that controls arousal. And so it affects activity in the rest of the brain. Um, an example, you know, in cats, again, sorry cat fans, but if the reticular formation fibers are disconnected from the rest of the brain, it sends cats into an instant coma. And so we will talk a lot about the reticular formation system and its importance when we get to the units um, like on consciousness and sleep and sleep disorders. Um, that plays a big role in kind of like your internal clock being located here. Um, in the reticular formation system, uh, an example of something, uh, the locus coeruleus, uh, which is just fancy Latin for blue spot. It's actually um, this grouping of cells, um, but each axon uh, of the group of cells in this area branches out to like hundreds of thousands of other neurons. And so studies on this blue spot have been showing connections between this area and um, depression, um, problems in this area as associated with ADHD, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, sleep disorders. So uh, the more we learn about this very small grouping but very um, powerfully connected set of neurons, uh, the more we'll understand how to help people that suffer from some of those disorders. Okay, the cerebellum, Latin for little brain, um, helps coordinate balance and movements. Uh, your physical and cognitive agility lie in the cerebellum. And so um, the cerebellum kind of tells um, 
the brain what to expect from the body's own movements, if that makes any sense. And so a really cool example is um, a study that they did um, in London where um, six people were lying in an MRI with eyes closed, not all in the same MRI, but they were in MRIs with their eyes closed. A and they used a rod uh, with, with foam to tickle um, the person's left palm. Um, the research uh, participants that um, that um, were like doing that themselves obviously don't have a cerebellum being activated um, and then the ones that were doing it um, you know having somebody do it to their hand actually we could see the cerebellum um, being activated um, and then in the third condition they actually um, secretly remove the foam and so that when the participants moved the rod they couldn't feel anything um, and so the fMRIs would just show them that when the person themselves is in charge of the movement whether there's a sensory thing processed or not it didn't matter because the cerebellum um, was active in telling the brain to ignore your own movement so if you've ever wondered why you can't tickle yourself, there's your answer. Um, if you ever wondered why the pressure of uh, just gravity on the soles of your feet doesn't seem to be something you always focus on, there's your answer, right? Um, but you will focus on things that are coming from outside stimuli, like stubbing your toe. And so the cerebellum will talk about a lot of, of important things related to physical and cognitive agility including memories uh, coming up soon okay so the midbrain um, so we're moving from bottom all and old on our way up we have the substantia nigra located in the midbrain and that is really fancy latin for black substance um, we know that this se section of the midbrain makes your movement smooth and so uh, an example of, of that is that um, if you look back and forth with your eyes, like your eyes can follow a subject without you having to move your whole head, and the movement with, within your eyes is a very fluid motion, and so um, that would be an important thing concerning the midbrain. Okay, so you can see so far nothing all that advanced going on with thinking. Um, basic uh, animal uh, reactions to the environment and, and survival with uh, autonomic features like heart rate and breathing. Okay, and so in our next video, video number four, we will actually explore um, the parts of the brain that uh, make us uh, more advanced than other animals. And so stay tuned for that. Thanks for listening, and again, bring any questions you have over this to class.